praise the Almighty God for His mercy and grace. You are tuned to Adventist World Radio, the voice of hope. Welcome to New Life Program, where you will not only learn, but also be entertained in an exceptional way. I'm your presenter, Tileno Diam. In everything we do, we have to put God first. Most of the couples who are married do not remember putting God first in their marriage. When we have Jesus Christ in our marriage, all will always be well. On that note, Susan Apondi will be sharing with us on the family life segment in the topic, Jesus in our marriage. Pastor Honya will then join us during the Bible segment on a topic known as the Trinity. Stay put. Little David, play on your harp, hallelujah, hallelujah. Little David, play on your harp, hallelujah, hallelujah. Little David, play on your harp, hallelujah, hallelujah. Little David, play on your harp, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Little David was a shepherd And he shouted for joy. David, play on your harp, hallelujah, hallelujah. Little David, play on your harp, hallelujah, hallelujah. Little David, play on your harp, hallelujah, hallelujah. Little David, play on your harp, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Old Joshua was. I told you earlier on, dear listener, in whatever we do, we should always put God first. We now give way to Susan Apondi to enlighten us more on this. Be blessed. Martin Luther, after his marriage to the nun across the way, spoke of the miracle of Jesus at the wedding feast when he turned the water into wine. Luther commented that if Jesus is not in your marriage or in my marriage, life is tasteless and without zest. But that when Jesus comes into your home, he always changes the water into wine. His presence transforms the ordinary and common relationship into one with zest and sparkle. Jesus takes away the drudgery. He takes away the coldness of duty and puts everyday happiness in its place. Rinka writes of her visit to a Chinese temple in the city of Shanghai. It was dark and shadowy inside, and the walls were lined with double rows of dusty idols on heavy pedestals. At the far end was a giant guided or gilded idol set above ground level amid heavy draperies that covered everything but its feet. Rosalind observed a woman coming in to worship. The woman burned incense and then waved it before the damp idol, prostrating herself before this 15-meter statue, all the while waiting for an answer. No answer came. Contrast that scene with the possibilities of worshipping a God who is alive, one who responds to your needs, one who is personally interested in every aspect of your life, one who cares about you. We have this privilege, the privilege of knowing a living God 
one who created and sustains all life, one who has revealed himself in the person of Jesus Christ. Now it is beautiful experience to reflect on the possibilities of worshipping one who can save you from sin, take away your guilt and shame, and promise you eternal life with him. If you have found this experience, you are blessed. How great will be your joy if both of you and your mate share in this experience? But what does it really mean to worship with your mate? Does it mean that we must attend church together regularly? That might help. But true worship takes place within the quietness of the person. True worship is when you place your will in the hands of Jesus Christ. True worship depends on the relationship you have with God rather than the conditions of the religious atmosphere of which or of where you attend the church. How can you find this kind of experience for yourself so that you and your mates might worship together? Here are five of the most essential ingredients involved in worshipping with your mate. 1. You must have the personal devotions. The depth of your worship experience is really measured by what happens when you leave the sanctuary after the church service. It is what happens in your life after the sanctuary is deserted. What takes place during the rest of the week in your home, at your job, during your social obligations, you are your church and it is your influence at this point that either speaks for or against your God. One young father rose early in the morning to have time for personal devotions. He was alone in his study before the rest of the household was up one morning when a sleepy-eyed daughter wandered in. Irritated with the interruption of his thoughts, he ordered her to get out. She ran tearfully to her mummy to ask what daddy was doing in his study. Mummy explained he's trying to learn to love the people at his office. Love the people at his office? When you can't be loving to your own family, personally or personal devotions must have a saving influence on your own life first. Fortunately, the father in this story learned from his experience and began inviting his daughter to join him for early morning prayers. One of the real problems with some Christians is that they have the paradoxical excitement of a news from a missionary about the conversion of a devil worshipper in a foreign land while they ignore the spiritual conditions that begin at one's own doorstep. The acid test of the worship experience is not concerned for marriage or for foreign missions. As important as this is to the function of the church, but rather what is going on between you and your mate at home? There is no way to live a healthy, consistent Christian life without devoting time to personal devotions. Trying to live the Christian life without it is like trying to drive a motor car without ever filling the petrol tank. You are tuned to Adventist World Radio, The Voice of Hope, broadcasting this new life program to you wherever you are. I'm your presenter, Tileno Diambo. If you have any views, comments, and suggestions about this program, we urge you to forward them to the producer, Adventist World Radio, P.O. Box 42276, code 00100, Nairobi, Kenya. Our email address is awrnairobi at eau dot adventist dot org Rise up, O men of God Have done with lesser things Give heart and soul and mind and strength To serve the King of Kings Rise up, O men of God The church for you Strength unequal to the task, rise up and make her great. Lift high the cross of Christ. Tread where his feet have trod, as brothers of Son of man, rise up. 
that you have been inspired by that wonderful piece of item, courtesy of Adventist World Radio. As we are being told from the Bible, sin originated from Adam and Eve when they disobeyed God by eating the forbidden fruit. Pastor Wahonya shed some light on this with a topic known as the Trinity of Sin. Dear listener, today we want to consider the trinity of sin. Have you ever heard of this? In 1 John 2 verse 15, it speaks of the trinity of sin when it says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Dear friend, here is the trinity of sin, the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. These three constitute the trinity of sin. They are, in their very nature, inseparable. They sum up sin in thought, in word, and in action. Let us consider the last of the eye. The Bible says that the eye is the light of the body. Therefore, if your eyes are good, then your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, then your whole body will be full of darkness. Matthew 6, verse 22 to 23. The condition of the eye, dear listener, therefore, affects the whole body. Satan has used the evil of the eye to destroy or ruin many people. He used the evil of the eye to destroy Samson. He used the same to destroy Achan and even David. He used the power of the eye to deceive Eve. What about the lust of the flesh? This sin must be considered one of the most hideous and deadly of all the manifestations of sins. It is the perversion of the natural propensities which eventually leads to excesses and moral weaknesses. Some members of the church at Corinth got involved in the debasing practices of the lust of the flesh, and because of this, the Apostle Paul strongly condemned their practices. Then there is the pride of life. Pride simply means to magnify oneself. It is the exaltation of the human ego. That was the downfall of Lucifer and of many in the world today, the Bible says that those who are victimized by this sin are, as it were, encompassed by a chain. Dear friend, how can we protect ourselves from this trinity of sin? Already in verse 17, the Apostle Paul warns that the world and its desires pass away but the man who does the will of God lives forever. We must therefore desire to do the will of God. With the passing of the world and its sinfulness, the lover of sin will also pass away. But he who sets his affections on the eternal God and on his everlasting kingdom and its ever live everlasting principles of righteousness 
will abide forever. We cannot, however, desire to do the will of God without the help of the Spirit of God. I therefore want to invite you, my dear friend, to live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. The Spirit of God will enable you to live as God would want you to live. Furthermore, in order for us not to leave the trinity of sin, I will suggest that you watch and pray constantly. Prayer will connect you with God, who provides power for overcoming temptation. Then you will be able to overcome the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. And when this happens in your life, you will find that you are a different person. You are a new creature in Jesus, and your life will never be the same again. That's all for today, my esteemed listener. Till we meet again, may our loving Father keep you safe. Write to us your comments and thoughts about this program and then send them to the producer, Adventist World Radio, P.O. Box 42276, code 00100, Nairobi, Kenya. Our email address is awrnairobi at eau.adventist.org. I have been your host, Tileno Dia. David, play on your heart, hallelujah, hallelujah, Play on your harp, hallelujah, hallelujah, David. Play on your harp, hallelujah, hallelujah, David. Play on your harp, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Little David was a shepherd boy. He came. And he shouted for joy. Little David, play on your harp, hallelujah, hallelujah, little David. Play on your harp, hallelujah, hallelujah, little David. Play on your harp, hallelujah, hallelujah, little David. Play on your harp, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Old Joshua was.
signs are clearly showing that our Lord will soon return. Oh, I pray these words I'm asking in your quiet heart will burn. When he comes, when he comes, when he
die. Now don't you let nobody turn you round, turn you round, turn you round. Nobody turn you round. Keep on the Galilee. I would not be a backslide. Have you no time for 